me ask you a question. Do you know for sure that you're going to be with God in heaven? Do you know for sure? If God were to ask you, why should I let you be with me in my heaven? What's your answer? These two bold, I mean, let's be honest, bold, essential questions from the evangelism explosion ministry. James Kennedy, you know, decades ago, have helped many Christians share their faith in a real way with family members and friends. And I do believe that what the, the great uh, pastor and writer and commentator J.C. Ryle says is true that a converted person, somebody who is truly saved in Jesus, will not want to go to heaven alone. Do you believe that? If you actually belong to Jesus, if you're actually saved, you don't want to go to heaven alone. You want everyone you know, not just the people you love, certainly the people you love, but also others that God places in your path to also go to heaven. Of course, we focused in the middle Wednesdays of the month of April, equipping you on how to share your faith with a couple of our sessions. I I led one, a basic one, kind of an introductory one, and then we had, speaking of EPC World Outreach, Mark Vanderput, a mission trainer from EPC World Outreach, uh, led us in specifically leading folks through the gospel, not only with the three circles story, narrative of the gospel, and talking with people about where they are in relation to the circles, but also it was interesting to me that Mark kept coming back to the evangelism explosion, key two questions, lead questions. And when he told his stories about sharing with people, some of whom have become Christian, some of whom are still thinking about it, for instance, Mark told... Uh, the story about some years ago, he evangelized a 92-year-old World War II veteran who, interestingly enough, had been a, a Presbyterian elder in Presbyterian churches, has served a number of times as an elder, I mean an elder in the church, of Presbyterian churches. And when Mark asked this man, this World War II veteran, this former Presbyterian elder, uh, the question about when God ask you, if he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? The 92-year-old said, well, I've been a good person and a good family man. I fought for my country against the Nazis and lived a good life for God. And Mark realized here was a man 92 years old who did not know the gospel and did not understand what it would be to be saved in Jesus Christ. So Mark was able to share the gospel with this retired man who was now in a uh, residential, um, senior residential area. And, and the man, thank the Lord, trusted himself actually to Jesus and to the gospel of Jesus. The man died a couple years later, but Mark rejoiced with us that now this man is with the Lord in heaven forever. But I, I want to invite you to ask yourself, Do I know I'll be in heaven communing with the Lord? And if God says, why should you be with me forever? What is your answer? You know, a sick, a sick, desperate man, woman, untouchable, has one hope. One hope. That hope is Jesus only. Jesus only touches untouchables. That's the title of our sermon for today. We're going to be turning to a couple passages of Scripture. We're moving along as we learn from and preach from the Gospel of Luke. So we'll be back to Luke chapter 5 in a moment. But first we're going to read just... Some verses from Leviticus chapter 13. I invite you to hear the word of God, both from Leviticus 13 as well as from Luke chapter 5. 
picking up at verse 44. He is a leprous man. He is unclean. Unclean. Tame. The priest must pronounce him unclean. Tame. His disease is on his head. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip, in other words, a covering up to his upper lip, and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is, let me repeat this, tame, unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And then to Luke chapter 5, picking up at verse 12. And it happened while he, Jesus, was in one of the cities. Behold, a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell face down and begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you are able to make me clean. And he, Jesus, stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present offerings for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But now the report about him spread even more and large crowds were coming to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Jesus only. Jesus only touches untouchables, and yes, you all know I like Rembrandt, so that's why you have that up there. Jesus only touches untouchables. And it happened, it came to pass when he was in one of the cities. I emphasize this Aginato and the markings on Aginato, three units, three units as part of a unit of seven teachings in the freshman year of developing disciples. Remember, the middle one is different after this, after these things. So we're at the second one now. And you will remember from last week's sermon, you can go back and listen to it, I made a pretty big point out of things just don't happen. When it says in the Bible, and it came to pass, it begs the question, who caused it to come to pass? You know the answer to that one? Who causes things to come to pass in your life? You know the answer to that one? I want to encourage you to know the answer to that one. I can go ahead and fill in that blank for you. It's God. And so God arranged this appointment. So it came to pass, it happened, when he was in one of the cities. Why is he in cities? Well, he's told us. We can go back to Luke chapter 4, verse 43. Jesus says, no, I'm not going to just stay in Capernaum. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what he's doing. He's preaching the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also. What is the good news of the kingdom of God? Well, we know from Jesus quoting Isaiah chapter 61 that it includes preaching, proclaiming good news to the poor, people who understand themselves to be desperately in need of a savior. You can be rich and yet be poor because you understand you have nothing, okay? You can be a Jew, you can be a Gentile. Anyway, he's come to preach good news to the poor. And as he says also, what is this preaching? Now, now I'm moving your head, I'm fast forwarding to the central of the seven units we're looking at right now. In the central one, this is not by accident, the key verse, the denouement of that central episode, Jesus says this, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are, what goes in the blank? What goes in the blank? But those who are, not those who think they're well, but those who are sick. You want to remember that because that links back to where we are right now. I have come not to call the righteous, but what goes in that blank? 
sinners. You see the connection here? Sick, sin. And by the way, the Greek word for save is the same as heal. It's just a little side note there. We'll come back to that a lot in Luke. Sick, sin. Unclean, sin. Two different categories, but interrelated in the Old Testament Torah. So, Jesus has come to heal the sick. To call, not the righteous, the people who think they are good church people and are, are the good people of the society are keeping up with the latest progressive value signaling, but to call sinners to repentance. Okay, now back into our uh, passage for today. We're going to start up and then we're going to pause. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to take you off and explain what's going on here. Behold, behold, ESV misses this, King James, a lot of other translations get it. I really want you to see that you do there, okay? Behold, you, this is shocking. In other words, behold, can you believe it? I, I never would have thought I would see the day. You know, this is, this is wild. Behold, we're really supposed to pay attention here. A man full of leprosy. And that doesn't just mean in the story that we're being told. That means as readers, we are supposed to stop and look at him. Understand? We're supposed to look at this situation. Behold, look. Look, a diseased man who, as the physician gospel writer, Luke, tells us, clarifies, on top of what you know, Mark says, full of leprosy. In other words, this is like stage four cancer that spread through the whole body. It wasn't just in one location, but now it's all over the place. Full of leprosy. His uncleanness needed no special expert in the law or no physician to, to diagnose. You know, you, you, anybody, a 10-year-old kid could see this man's full of leprosy. Um, I've read to you the law from Leviticus 13. You understand he's not supposed to be where he is. But we know, for instance, from the story of Elisha and the Syrian and the war with the Syrians in 2 Kings chapter 7, for instance, the lepers during the day already back then, way before Jesus' time, were coming up to just outside the city walls and gates and begging because they need food. And so they would beg. And so in 2 Kings 7, you got some beggars, some leper beggars outside the gate, right outside the gate during the day. At night, they have to beat it. But, you know, these Galilean cities that Jesus is in, they don't have walls. And I can just see a guy kind of like slightly kind of creeping in a little bit closer and maybe just inside the city because you can get a lot better handouts that way. Now, here he is. And let's go ahead and deal with, I'm going to note two things here. You've got an issue of ritual purity which is a life and death matter before the holy God. I'll come back to that. But secondly, you also have community fear of contagion, basic life and death and societal realities. We're gonna take these in reverse order. Community fear of contagion. Now, we could read this, and probably you might have read this four or five years ago and said, oh, those old-timey people, they were so rough on the sick. That's so, you know, antiquated that they would freak out and you know quarantine people and cast them out of the camp and everything and and not allow them and, and make them have a uh, a covering of their face all the way up to their upper lip only it occurred to me now i'm older than most of y'all but i actually was living in the years this is ancient times now 2020 20 and 2021 were any of y'all alive then already you may remember you shall wear a covering up to, and actually not just the upper lip, but over the nose. Any of y'all remember? Weren't these beautiful? I, I have not seen many of y'all wearing these lately. I don't understand why, because they were so cool. And, uh, you, you know, you remember all the protocols, right? Uh, it was a lot of fun to live in 2020 and 2021. And you know what? If somebody even, you know, contact tracing, if I had even been near somebody with COVID, people freaking out and everything, he needs to be quarantined! Get him out of the camp! The one thing on the protocols that we missed, and I need to write or email the CDC about this, for some reason we didn't make people stand at, Josephus tells us they had to be 100 feet away from anybody else and call out, unclean, unclean. We should have been yelling out, COVID, COVID, stay away from me. Okay, so this is actually not just ancient times. People in our day freak out 
about contagion. Did y'all know this? Are you willing to admit this? People freak out and do all kinds of barriers and quarantining and, you know, contact tracing and all this kind of stuff. Now, if this man, um, let me just say that, that certainly the Levitical description and even, you know, 1,500 years later at the time of Jesus, skin diseases, you got a whole range, okay? And this law is covering a range, not just what we would classically call leprosy. But if we are talking about Hansen's disease, in this case with this man, understand this, or any kind of skin disease close to Hansen's disease, this man stinks of decay and death. He stinks. I mean, I'm being serious here. This is not metaphorical. He has a stench on him. He's got dying flesh all over him. He's a walking corpse. And according to the great Christian doctor who was the world expert on uh, leprosy, Hansen's disease in the, in the 20th century, wonderful books. I commend all his books to you. You know, fearfully and wonderfully made, just great books. But Paul Brand, that mission doctor who worked with the lepers and the leper colonies, called leprosy a painless hell. A painless hell. You know how I know a lot of people who complain about pain? Pain is actually a gift that signals adjustment, right? But see, someone with Hansen's disease after a while feels no pain. And they start losing their toes, their fingers, you know, knocking them off, and they can't feel a thing. In fact, what Dr. Brand used to do with his leprosy patients in India is he would send them home with a cat. Why? For companionship? No so that rats and mice would not come and gnaw off parts of the leprous person because they could not feel a thing when they were sleeping. Now let's go back to the purity issue though, the, the spiritual issue. This is a life and death matter before God. 101, just basic summary on Torah, holiness and ritual purity. I'll take you to a couple verses. The first verse is the one that keys us here. Leviticus 10, 10 through 11. You are, he's telling Aaron as the high priest, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean. And you're supposed to teach all these statutes and commandments that the Lord has given through Moses to you. Okay, now notice, I've got it charted for you here. We got two different levels here. One, um, one bifurcation between what is kadosh, holy, and what is the common, hakol, okay? You've got two, okay. Then when you get down to common, there's a division there between what is clean, taher, and what is unclean or impure, tameh, okay? So look, something that is both common but also specifically unclean should not be anywhere close to something that is holy and certainly should not be close to the holy God. You don't mess around with that. The Bible's law and teachings about ritual purity and uncleanness arise from the reality of God's holiness and a total necessity to be reverent and real about who God is. No, God is not just your fishing buddy that you make jokes about. God is holy. And remember that God is the holy author of life. And this is really where this uncleanness issue goes to, okay? So, death and signs of death and decay, which reflect our fallenness under the curse as a result of our sin, should not be anywhere close to holy communion with God. Got me? So, all these things, the wrong foods, the wrong, you know, the, 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 the spilling of, you know, fluids, the, the, the Hansen's disease, other skin diseases, they're, they're signs of who we are as mortal, sinful people dying under the curse. You've got to be serious about who God is as holy, which leads us to the Levitical laws on cleanliness and purity, ritual purity, in chapters 11 through 15 of Leviticus. Um, and you've got issues of contagious defiling of people. You've got to be careful about this. So in Leviticus 13 and 14, we have the most extensive part of this segment of the Bible, and it's about skin diseases, as well as mold and, and clothes and houses being infected also. 
And I know most of you read that every night as your nightly devotional, but I'm just reminding you in case you forgot from last night. So here, here's the big issue in Leviticus. By the way, let me go ahead and give you a heads up. Jesus is going to blow all this stuff out of the water by grace as we move our way through Luke. Okay? He's upholding it, but he's going to move us through it. The big issue of Leviticus 11, and in fact, this whole section, and in fact, the whole Old Testament, is God says, I, the Lord your God, am holy, so you also shall be holy. Now, we're back to our story. A desperate, impure, sick, and untouchable, full of leprosy, has one hope. And this is where I want to take you to today, because this involves your soul and your eternity. I really want you to be able to answer this, not just intellectually, but spiritually. Let me pull back one more time. Who is Jesus? Well, when the angel Gabriel prophesied to Mary and said, you're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born to you will be called what? What's the one word he will be called? The main word? Holy. The Son of God. When Jesus cast out the demon in Capernaum from the man who's demonically possessed, what is the demon shouting out to Jesus? This is Luke 4, 34 and 35. Leave us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The demon knows this. Now, who is he? And a demon better not be near the holiness of God, right? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, and he cast him out of the man. Okay, so let's get this. Even a demon understands this. A confronted, desperate demon. He wasn't worried about being in synagogue, about being in church. For all we know, he'd been there for years possessing this man, and it was no big deal. But when Jesus walks into synagogue, suddenly we have major catastrophe. So a desperate demon has one true fear. Can you fill in the blank? What's, what's, what's the desperate demon's one true fear? Jesus only, the Holy One of God. Now, so to our story, behold, a man full of leprosy. He's in the city. I've talked about that. He's really getting desperate. He's kind of violating the rules, and then he's going to violate them further because, behold the leper. Here he is, totally ostracized, even from his own family. You understand that in these days, people had lots of children. So if I have a child who's leprous, am I going to let my other children contract leprosy and all be condemned? What do you think? No. No. I follow the law. My child is out. If this is an older man who's married, his wife and his household have to cast him out. Now, can you imagine going for months and even years, never being able to see in person, touch your own spouse, your own children? This, this is who this man is now. Behold, a man full of leprosy. Are you seeing him yet? reminds us of David who of course Jesse had eight sons when Saul's coming after David you think Jesse's going to sacrifice the other seven sons for David no way and so David I just reflect on this in Psalm 27 says for my father and my mother have forsaken me but who the Lord will take me in is our hope going to be in the law what do you think it's going to be in the fulfiller of the law, but not in the law. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. A sick, desperate, untouchable, full of leprosy has one hope. Do you know the answer? I mean, the demon knows what he needs to be afraid of. Do you know to whom you need to run to be saved? to whom you need to look for your salvation. Who is it? Jesus only. Not Jesus and. Jesus only. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Behold, a man full of leprosy upon seeing Jesus. 
Are, are you seeing Jesus? Are you looking to Jesus? Upon seeing Jesus, fell face down and begged him, Lord, Lord. We don't know how deep this Lord goes. As I told you last week, every other time we've seen Lord, it's either talking directly about God or about Jesus as the Christ at the level of Christologically being the Son of God. Here, we don't know. But we know this, you don't have to be a theologian to be saved, you just need to trust in Jesus. And he calls on Jesus as Kyrios, Lord, and he says this, this is a profound statement. I, I don't read this as, you know, third cycle conditional. I, I read this as flat out. If you are blank, then you are blank to cleanse me. What does this guy say? He says, if you are willing, if you're willing to do it, you are able. You have the power. I know you do. If you will. He's truly praying to Jesus. Desperate faith. Probably not sure exactly how this works or exactly who Jesus is. He probably can't write a theology book on it, on Christological implications of this. But man, he is flat out on his face before Jesus. Jesus' only faith. And Jesus, reaching out his hand, touched him. Now, you, are you seeing this man? He's, he's full of leprosy, which means he's had leprosy for a long time, which means he has not been touched by anyone in years. Not by his children, not by his spouse, not by anyone. And if they touch him, they become impure and out of the camp. But who, in his own ontological reality, is holy unto himself? Who is more powerful than all our sickness and all our sin? You know the answer? Jesus. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him and said, I am willing. Oh, don't you want to hear that? I am willing to be cleansed. Here we have the proclamation of Jesus' divine power and also his divine compassion, the heart of Jesus, the heart of the gospel. He is willing and able to heal. And this is the gospel of God's reign, God's rule, God's kingdom. Life, true life, comes through Jesus, the author of life. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. God's holiness is infinitely more powerful than our sin and our rotting and our you know, decimation. Jesus' holy healing hand was more powerful by far than the disease and death of the leper. And immediately, the leprosy left him. This is not like the Naaman story, you know, Elisha and Naaman, where he's got to go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. It's on the word, on the, on the touch and the word of Jesus. Jesus says, tell no one, go show yourself to the priest and present offerings for your cleansing as Moses instructed. We're back to Leviticus 14 right now. And Jesus says, do this as a testimony under the law. Jesus is not only fulfilling the law, he's also making a testimony to the priest. And the healing that Jesus, that Jesus does that Reed will talk about next week, we're going to have, in effect, a witness to the experts in the law. Okay? Different kind of testimonies or different directions. But even more now, it's a crisis. It's a problem for Jesus because the crowds gather even more. And what does Jesus do? He knows he can't be with the crowd all the time. Do you understand you can't be with the crowd all the time? Jesus withdraws to desolate places. And what does he do? If Jesus does it, what I need to do all the time? Pray. Now, let me just hit the paradox here for you. You understand this is a prophecy about the cross. Because Jesus heals the man and he comes into the camp and he's now in communion, the leprous man. But what does this do to Jesus? It drives him more and more outside the camp. 
all the way to the point where because of our sin and Jesus healing me and you, Jesus is going to be driven outside the city and die on the cross for you. And we are talking about you and me. We're talking about us, folks. Um, we, are, we are ourselves desperate sinners. We're dead men walking. We're the dead men walking. Do you know that? I mean, we really are. Uh, Isaiah tells us this. This is not just under Leviticus. Uh, let's go to the next, and look at this. When Isaiah, I mean, the holiest man in Israel is in the presence of holy God, and the seraphim are singing the Trisagion, the holy, holy, holy. What does Isaiah say? Woe is me. Now, I am a man of what kind of lips? Unclean. Unclean. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Let's go over to Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Paul is going to resonate with this in Romans now. Filthy rags, okay? We all have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous, supposedly righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf in our iniquities, like the wind take us away. You're the leper. I'm the leper. Is everybody getting the message? And desperate people, dying people, have one hope. What is that hope? Jesus, Jesus, I want to invite you to look to Jesus, to call on Jesus, to come to Jesus, run to him, look to him, Jesus only, and no saving grace now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.